For now, I'm so excited to welcome you all to the Writer Center virtual craft chat series where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little more about how they wrote it. My name is Emily Holland and I'm thrilled to have Alina Poskova joining us as tonight's guest in celebration of her poetry collection, Tosca. Thank you for joining us, Alina. So excited to have you here. Um, so I think if you could start us off with a brief reading and then we'll we'll kind of jump into the questions. That would be great. Sure. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you to the Writer Center. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know this event is free, but your time isn't free. So I really appreciate it. I'm stoked to be here with you virtually. Um, I'm going to read uh, the first poem in the collection, which kind of, I think, like frames the rest of the work. So even if you have no familiarity with anything else at all, the rest of the conversation will make a sort of sense to you if you just listen to this one poem, I think. It's called Take Care. I've been trying to remember where I am. On the phone, I said, this feeling is so familiar, like a long drive and no recollection of steering. There's never an arrival point, only endurance and the occasional sensation of re-entry into what kind of world this is. How investors now trade water futures, and for the first time, what's human made outweighs what lives on this planet. No one I know has portfolios, but we hear of rising stocks, generating more wealth for no one we know. 78% are at least somewhat concerned about the growing level of inequality. 48% are very concerned, the survey says, indicating all odds in favor of a rev, and yet. The state where I live legalized autonomous delivery robots classified as pedestrians. The country where I live, its surveillance of us surveilled by the country I'm from, has endless funds and capacity to terrorize those without the right documents, arrest someone for making off with baby formula. Some in my family say there are proper channels to citizenship having overridden their own origin stories years ago. In adapting to regional customs, one becomes a citizen of border and bootstrap mythologies. I'm fully local presenting now, assuring various robots that I'm not a robot several times daily, microdosing Adderall from a friend's RX to achieve a smooth email voice obediently separating recyclables, even if I've seen it carried off in the same truck? Who am I to say what's sustainable in the face of the daily death ticker? The only economy I know is stem cuttings, pickled cabbage, shared logins, the same 20 bucks passed around more urgently now. The luckiest among us score mental health days, what might in an alternate timeline be the ability to simply exist. Take care is just a sign off and not in the purview of policy. As government funded weather modification programs make it rain by launching rockets full of silver iodide into the clouds, it can be calming to think about celestial objects moving around in ancient patterns that precede all our fuck ups, that meddle with our lives in ways unknown to most. The coming great conjunction is a time to release old habits. Maybe I'll quit trying to find oblivion in someone else when there's a usable one waiting among these slow days of everything filed as pattern or scarcity. Squirrels gorging on pumpkin innards, muffled name spelling at the pharmacy counter, runners stretching their hamstrings on stoops, friends shit talking what dead poets said in letters after running out of current gossip, we deride the algorithms for not getting us, as if searching and lurking signal anything, save for all this muted hunger. I'm no exception, dreaming of how different my life could be if I had a delicate neck tattoo or hex countering floor cleaner. My algorithm delivers a $200 workshop on clearing ancestral traumas and inherited unconscious impulsions, plus a $1,240 purse made to resemble a croissant. But I've already spent my poetry grant on back payments and one truly decadent burger. 
It's somewhere toward the end of the Anthropocene, and still I want to fall in love the Wong Kar Wai way, though I have the heart of a slacker, and everyone seems too woke or weary for a ruinous type of intimacy. Leaving the productivity app kills my productivity shrub. After so many days of blue light, I miss creature comforts like karaoke duets and wobbly elbow-linked walks and buckling into someone's palm, a real voice in my ear. Big pink neon with its yellow spur, outside boot and saddle, blinks off for the last time, as someone says, we'll have it all back someday. A rowdy bacchanal awaits those of us left, and I'd ask who's buying if we hadn't already watched the doomsday clock nudge forward again, if I had flinched then. That's it. Just a, a buoyant pandemic poem to start us off. Thank you. No, I'm so, so glad that you read the long one, the opening poem. I think sometimes we shy away from reading the long poems, right? But you're so right in, in saying that it really captures so much of what the collection is about. So we'll definitely be circling back and talking about all those things. And, and thank you so much for, for reading. Um, first of all, could you just tell us a little bit about who you are, maybe how you came to poetry? Oh boy. Yeah. Who am I? <laughs> the questions, <laughs> the book seeks to answer this question, I suppose. Um, I came to poetry. Um, I don't even know. I feel like I've always been surrounded by it. Like my maybe everyone's parents did this at some point but my mom has these like mythologies about like what happened to me when I was in the womb and what happened to me when I was in the womb is like I got read a lot of poetry <laughs> but I also got taken to a Billy Joel concert and I hate Billy Joel so like I don't know about like these transmissions being received but I think the poetry thing stuck um I spent the first few years of my life in Moscow which I talk about in the book is like a city that just like I mean for all the current faults that we can say about Russia and its leader and things. Um, culturally, they've always revered poetry. Like there are statues of poets everywhere. I cannot really think of that being that pervasive in America, unless you like, you know, you go to New Jersey, there's probably like a Walt Whitman statue or something, but it was like, it was so ubiquitous the way that like pop music is ubiquitous. It wasn't like a special interest that people had. Like my dad has like a, maybe a middle school education at best, like grew up in a tiny village in Ukraine and he can recite poems off the top of his head. It was kind of just like baked into like, Soviet schooling. Um, so I think there was a bit of that. <laughs> and, um, but how I started writing it, I wish I could remember. I think I just always loved, um, like I loved punk music and, and other music that was kind of emotionally intense and sometimes lyrically also. And I can't, uh, I don't have like a musical aptitude. <laughs> so I guess I thought I would try poetry instead. And that seems to have stuck. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And yeah, I love that sort of thinking about a culture where poetry is sort of revered as an art form and as something that's important to daily life in a way that we don't really see um, as much in American culture. Yeah. All right. Now we're going to get to the hard question. We get the difficult one right out of the way. Um, at the beginning. And, and some people really like this question, but it is, it is kind of tricky. So um, what's something that you have not been asked about your work that you've been wanting to talk about, or what's something that maybe you notice within your poems that hasn't been brought up to you yet? A couple of different ways of maybe looking at that. Yeah, I've been really lucky. I've been interviewed a couple times about my work um, by wonderful people, including you, and really insightful, really perceptive stuff. Often the opposite happens, like I'm asked about things that I didn't really consider, and it gives my me insights into my own work. I'm like, this makes me sound way smarter than like I, I conceived of myself, but something that I've been thinking about, and like maybe this is because I'm me, and I, I co-edit um, a literary magazine that's like focused on sex, desire, and intimacy, is that like there's a lot of like sex in this book and no one ever wants to talk to me about it, which I think has like probably a lot of reasons, like probably like, you know, depending on the publication, they don't really want to go there or like maybe there's nothing really to ask beyond the fact that it exists. Um, or maybe like it's something that stands out to me and doesn't stand out to other people, but it's like no one ever mentions it. But I think also like when I was finishing the manuscript, I was in a workshop with someone who was um, 
like a full-time sex worker. And she was like, I don't really think these poems are that sexual. I think there's like a lot of like um, that dissociation with like detachment from mm -hmm. the thing where it's like, you're looking at it from like a great distance and sort of trying to understand what's happening, but it's not like erotic. And I was like, that is really perceptive. And like, I didn't notice that that was what was happening. So maybe that's something to do with it. But like, yeah, I've never been asked unless I've like asked for a specific feedback about mm -hmm those parts of it but yeah that's no that's interesting I think you know it's it's interesting because we know each other for uh, you posted five years now that's really wild to me um from barrel house writer camp and and we were sort of writing things on similar themes but we didn't really realize that until I got some work in at at bedfellows your magazine and and I think it's it was so great to see the collection come together and I was like these are the themes like these are what I'm obsessed with and really to see that come through um was was wonderful and and so maybe I have a question about kind of anchoring those themes in in a manuscript and the evolution of those themes so how did you go from maybe what you were writing those five years ago to the manuscript that it is now um, and how did you see those themes evolve, where sex evolved, where these themes of maybe time and, and the immigrant identity and, of course, capitalism and all of those things that we've, we've been kind of um, going through in the, the more recent years as well. Um, yeah, I'm wondering about sort of the evolution of that. Yeah, I think I just got like angrier in the last <laughs> five years. It started out of, as a book, mostly, I think about like a sort of ennui around like oh I really thought like sexual liberalism I really thought like being like adventurous and saying yes to everything and like having all of these experiences and like talking about them frankly was like one kind of inroad to like understanding myself and like myself in relation to the world and others and like intimacy and then hitting these walls I'm <laughs> just like oh this isn't like no matter how you approach this as you move through the world, you will not be met with the same kind of like, you know, thing back. Like you, mm. there's a lot of like boredom, a lot of like dissatisfaction, um, all of that, which like I hadn't really accounted for in like when I started that adventure. But then also, you know, just like so many things about the world seem to be getting worse and it like glitched out. I think I literally say that in the book, glitched out my libido. <laughs> where I was like, oh, everything's like interfering um, with, with my ability to like, you know, exist in this way. And then of course the pandemic. And then also like being a little more open to, like I had this like really strong resistance to like the marketingness of like, I'm an immigrant queer woman and I'm like writing about things that I, I think are like, they come out in the like my identity comes out in the poems but I was really resistant to writing poems that are like strictly like you know the way that they get categorized on like poets.org or whatever like I just really don't believe in poetry functioning in that way and like I know that presses do it for like marketing reasons and all of this but like I felt really resistant to it to the point where I just like didn't address a lot of this stuff that like makes me who I am until like later on in the writing process of the book and mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm grateful that I opened my my topical like you know concerns in this way but that was like something I was navigating throughout of just mm. like I really don't want to you know write a poem about like third generation holocaust trauma which is like it's like totally valid but like do I feel like that has anything to do with me on like a day-to-day -day basis no and so like would it be great like uh for getting me like university talks and stuff sure but like would mm. I be able to sleep at night no so like you know navigating all of that has been yeah. like a process yeah, these sort of negotiations that we make as artists, I'm I'm really captivated by that and sort of the opening up that we see. I think this book is so open and it has this sort of intimacy that really like pulls the reader in. Um, and it's always difficult to negotiate like how much of that do you do you let the reader see or do you want the reader to see on that level? Um yeah, that's, exactly. it's difficult. And it does take time too, right? I mean, books don't happen overnight and they go through so, so many transformations too. Um, great. All right. So let me get to some questions I actually sent you so that we can get on track. Um, 
maybe we'll start by talking just about the title poem um because I of course you know when you see a title you want to kind of look it up and find you know the meaning right and Tosca is one of those words that I think has been pinned down but not quite pinned down right it's a little bit untranslatable in this sense and we were talking pre chat starting about sort of the different ways that it can be pronounced as well and so I'm wondering just about this sense of of untranslatableness um, and how maybe for you it took on a certain meaning for the book overall and and how that poem became the title poem or how the title became the title yeah, it's uh, it became a really useful anchor. Like I didn't actually, I wanted to call the book something else and then literally everyone talked me out of it and they were like, this is great. You got to stick with this. I was like, fine. But uh, Tosca or Tosca like comes from the Russian verb uh, Toskat, which I don't know if like, that's often mentioned in like these write-ups about it, but um, that word is like uh, to drag something heavy around, right? And so like the is the feeling of dragging something heavy around kind of like existentially I guess um just like feeling there's this weight on you um this heaviness and you can't attribute it to any specific source and then like the more I thought about it the more I was like oh most of the work does speak to that in in some capacity um and that title poem was probably like the the hardest and heaviest one to write because mm -hmm. I sort of yes talked kind of around but also into and through various things that were making me feel that way and then like trying to convey that to others like including my mother and then like feeling like sort of you know not understood and I think like throughout my life really in part because you know I came here and had to like learn a second language and felt like um at some point like the people I spoke Russian with I wasn't fully communicating what I wanted mm -hmm. to and then like people I spoke English to like same like something was still like lost in the middle and then also feeling like I felt this way my whole life that like there's some kind of like membrane between me and the world and like I don't know if it's like my astrological orientation as like an Aquarius but like I've always felt a little bit like an alien like I don't I don't know that I'm like getting myself across in the way that like I hear myself in my head and like mm -hmm. poetry has been like this great endeavor to like puncture that you know and and try to like get things across like this untranslatability of experience you know and how to like convey things I mean that's like all that my poems can do is like my my subjectivity or whatever but like is it working am I using the right words you know like uh Jack Gilbert has this great line which I love him I, I quote him in the book but like he says how astonishing it is that language can almost mean and frightening that it does not quite you mm. know that's that's what it's all about <laughs> like you can get as close as you possibly can with language and even even like a word like the sky which is so specific and you're still not quite getting at, at the feeling or, or the thing um but you know it's fun to keep trying yeah yeah no I love that I love that Gilbert quote because something that I always think about with poems is that especially when you know there's so much emphasis on like how do you interpret this poem right but I think they're all just attempts at getting closer to meaning and I think like the more we're grasping at those attempts like the closer we get but you can never quite pin it down right and I think that Tosca really embodies that and sort of anchors the collection in that sense of of the speaker grasping for meaning through different ways right through experiences through time through this maybe displacement that they're feeling and desire of course coming into play too um yeah I I really love that um I wanted so we're talking about language and you have a line in the poem place that says there's the language a language becomes and I read that and I had to close the book because I was like, I have to sit with this line for a while. Like I just have to kind of sit in this language because it just wraps you up in it, right? Um, and it it gets at some of the core concerns of the book, this speaker's identity as an immigrant, that transformation, maybe constant becoming or that sense of being in between two places. Um, and of course the poem place gives an idea of groundedness but it's also embodying these these two spaces um 
So I'm thinking about how language and place function within the book, but also for you as a poet, these sort of dualities, right? Russian and English and maybe Moscow and Philly or America in general in some way. Um, how do you sort of embody those within your work and, and what do they do for you maybe as, as anchors or themes that you find yourself drawn to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I come into writing about place in a number of ways. Like I love I love Philly so much, and I love um, mentioning like hyper specific, hyper local like shout outs, like boot and saddle in, in the poem that I read, um, because I just I love um, reading work from people who like live in different places and like you know seeing what they notice about the place that they're in. That's one thing. So that's like real anchored in place. But then like the other side of that is like the place that I'm from, like literally doesn't exist anymore like the Soviet Union is not a thing so I'm like writing about a culture and a place that like I barely experienced that like uh, my family like brought here kind of like I'm, I'm having like this like second hand you know kind of a downloading of it like I want to keep parts of it alive especially language and then like uh, feeling myself losing my grip on that as like time goes on as the place itself changes like I used to love talking about how I'm Russian and from Russia and Russian culture. And now I just like, you know, do it at a low mumble because it's not it's not a great time. And like, also, I don't even know if like, you know, the Russia that I'm from or identify with is is I was born in Moscow. Sorry to mention that, um, you know, like, what am I even talking about? Like, am I, I'm talking about like something that was like relayed to me that I never got to like experience myself in, in some cases. Um, and then like grappling with that and grappling with like what is my like part of it to tell and like what part of it doesn't belong to me um, all of that so yeah <laughs> I feel like I got away from the question but like oh, <laughs> no no that's great I think you know there is a sense of sort of grasping for something that's maybe slipping away and I think in so many of the poems, we feel the speaker being sort of both grounded, but also unmoored in their experiences and in memory and and these stories that are passed down. I think there's some really great moments where um, we're getting sort of like the secondhand retelling of different stories in different ways. And, and I think that all of that lends itself to creating the atmosphere of the book where we're sort of in a space that's here but also leaving and and disappearing in some shape or form um and that feeling is unsettling in a good way through the book um maybe not a good way to personally experience but <laughs> and just to remind folks if you have questions um about the book or questions regarding poetry things like that please pop them into the chat um I still have plenty so we we won't run out of things to talk about um so you mentioned Jack Gilbert so maybe I'll jump to the question about inspirations because there's so many different people that populate the book or different figures that populate the book so of course Gilbert but I also noticed some Fleetwood Mac references and then you have names of other poets and friends that are that are here in the book as well um, some names that I recognize, but I'm just wondering what writers you really see yourself in conversation with on the page, and maybe who do you find yourself returning to in some way for inspiration? Mm -hmm. I, I, well, I kind of like to mash influences together and like call them out in my work. So like all of the detritus that like makes up, you know, our daily existence that we just like, you know, um, are surrounded by. So you know, high and low art. So like I'm influenced by so many disparate things. Like I love, you know, really stylistically inventive and like more formal poets like Carl Phillips, whose work is nothing like mine, but like really like learn a lot from him about just like writing about desire in this like very, you know, open way and uh, making like interesting sy syntactical choices, which like I myself always attribute to like being ESL and not using words correctly, but then like seeing someone with like a strong grasp of English, like using words differently, like empowers me to like keep doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but also like, you know, like, like I said, love um, punk music is a huge part of like my um, coming of age and like a little to some extent my adult life. So like that stuff makes its way in. Um, but like in general, I'm very influenced by like the several generations of New York school poets. So like 
Frank O'Hara, a huge one, um, Joe Brainerd, uh, Bernadette Mayer, Ted Berrigan, Eileen Miles. Um, and that was where I really felt, because um, I was never really drawn to like really traditional kind of like formal, um, dare I say, like lofty, florid kind of poetry. And like when I read these conversational works that were still like very astute, very like well-crafted, very smart, very interesting, very engaging, but like that treated the things that happen in our quotidian existence as like poem worthy, that was like, that was it for me. That was like, I took that and I ran with it. So like, that's where I got like mentioning your friends in poems that like, kind of like all of that is just as valid and like belongs in the poem just as much as like references to like Greek mythology or something. And it's like, you don't actually need to know the person that I'm mentioning to understand like what's going on here. It's actually kind of like a more of a meeting the reader where they are than like, you know, having these references that people have to look up and stuff, even though like there's yeah. some of that in the book too. And I have like a note section and whatever, but kind of the idea that like everything that happens to you on a daily basis, like where you eat lunch, what you eat for lunch, like what your friend said that was funny, like all of that has a place in a poem. I definitely mm -hmm. learned from the New York school. And like, I think that's just gonna be my mode forever. This kind of like almost always first person, like very vernacular, like I am very insistent on my poem sounding the way that like I would talk. Like I don't put anything in a poem that I wouldn't say out loud in some way, which maybe is not everyone's deal, but you know, it's like the speaker is me, but that's, there, there's no like, you know, we can, we can say that to be like proper, but like, really it's like, she talks the way that I would talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. All of that came out of, and like also Joe Brainerd's like generosity towards like community and like friendship and like art being something that's like collaborative and like mm. non-hierarchical and like sharing, like he like gave all his paintings away and now they're in like MoMA and stuff, but like originally he gave them to his friends. It's like the idea that you produce art, like primarily for like the people around you who like get you and who you're in community with and like have shared affinities with was yeah. also like very important and empowering to me and and still is so yeah yeah I love that I think it it's so freeing as a poet when you maybe encounter someone that is doing something that you didn't think you had permission to do on the page right and it's like wait I can put that in a poem and there's there's all these sort of invisible roadblocks that we learn through just what we're exposed to and then something comes in and sort of derails that and really opens up the world and I think yeah you're so right I mean Joe Brainerd was one of those poets for me and in Frank O'Hara as well really early on I was like oh like poetry can be very personal and very um like spoken and, and and it doesn't have to have this sort of decoded ability to it that maybe we're we're learning in school on some level um and I'm thinking about the the way that especially the New York school kind of had that blend between poetry and art in certain ways the visual art and and how there's other arts that come into play in, in your work as well and sort of the 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 lines between um the blurring of those lines I think is really really beautiful um I did want to talk about community a little bit um and maybe to get to the question in the chat too from Benny what's your writing process um so maybe if you want to answer Benny's question about process but then my question was how does community factor into your writing process because you're so active in Philly you have the magazine and then you also have the Chabarashka Collective did I say that right um that and I just think that I'm always seeing you out and doing things and really supporting the the community in different ways and and I know that that has some influence and and um power on on your work as well so yeah maybe a two-parter about writing process and community yeah I I mean I don't think I would I would be a poet at all if I didn't have uh, people around me um, who I was in community with who like inspire me and influence me and like I bounce things off of and whatever and I think that was extra important to me I mean for a lot of reasons but I know that a lot of people get MFAs or go to MFA programs to find that kind of community and I just kind of like decided I wasn't going to pursue that kind of um, way of of being in in poetry and so then that meant I have to like build my own community then and like mm -hmm. find it and luckily I'm in Philly where there's so many amazing poets and I just had an, like a model very early on where um C.A. Conrad still lived here 
we claim them they they are a Philly poet I don't care where they live they're always going to be a Philly poet but like just seeing this very like you know talk about like feeling like you're giving permission to like be a certain way as a poet I was like there's this like mystical figure wearing a giant crystal standing up in front of everyone talking in this voice that is very much not like what we call poet voice you know <laughs> and like also being so generous and so like kind and supportive yes he yeah. Uh, to younger poets and just being like, oh, right, okay, so I can like have mentorships and like sort of like informal kind of like, you know, teachers that aren't like in a classroom or whatever and and still like learn from from people and have these like wonderful multi-generational friendships um, that exist outside of institutions. And that's something I still like, you know, even though like I, I, I finished my book, I like did the project or whatever, it's like, it doesn't stop being important. Um, it's not just for like a feedback loop or like, you know, showing drafts to or whatever. It's just like my friends continually inspire me and also like keep me keep me in perspective about like why I do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, cause I, you know, I'm terminally online, you know, Emily, you see me online. <laughs> like, but, you know, the, the version of like poetry and being a poet that exists online can like really throw me in terms mm -hmm. of like, oh, are we supposed to be like submitting to prizes? Are we supposed to be like publishing in, in these fancy places? Are we like is that is that the treadmill that we're on and like just remembering time and time again that's like that's not what I got into this for like it's not interesting or important to me like that careerist stuff and then like having you know my friends and community around um to sort of like affirm and like remind me that that's like not not that's not what's like fun or interesting to me about about this um, whether it's like the Chabrasco Collective where I feel like we have like shared like cultural experiences that we really like you know vibe with and like support each other around where it's like you know questions of like do I feel comfortable like writing about my family in this way how would you navigate this do you show your family your work because we're all like you know children of pushy immigrant parents who like do not understand like why we would have like anything bad to say about like <laughs> our childhood or upbringing or culture or whatever um so like more casual stuff like yeah the poets around me in Philly like I did you know my first readings here and like really felt like I don't know. I was like, if these people like what I'm doing, it must be onto something, <laughs> you know. So yeah, huge, huge part of my of my writing life. Awesome. No, that's great, and I think it really shows too. Just you know, there's poems in here that are dedicated to friends or poets. There's all those different mentions, and I think it just builds the the world of the book um, in a really beautiful way. Wonderful. Um, maybe a question that I'm going to go off the cuff here, um, just to talk a little bit about composing the book and putting these poems together. Um, and I think so often, you know, book trends come and go and, and how long is a book supposed to be and what's it supposed to do? And do you divide it into parts and, you know, all those questions that come up, um, can you just talk about how you, you sort of collected these poems and and when did you really start realizing that this was the project that would become the book and, and what you wanted to say in it oh yeah that's I mean I just like I I, I kept writing poems like I'm really I, I guess one good thing about not being goal oriented in in these ways where it's like I, well, I need to have enough poems to have a book it's just like I was just like I'm just gonna keep writing until like I feel like I've said all all I can say in this like direction. Um, and that apparently took five years, I guess. And then I still didn't believe that it like, I was like, I don't know, and I have this pile of poems, right? And I'm like carrying this pile of papers around to readings. Like maybe, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if I could just like <laughs> it was like a pragmatic uh, concern. I'm just like, I'm sick of printing out poems. But I took um, a manuscript development workshop with the poet Ted Reese, another great Philly poet. Um, and everyone in the workshop was like, this is a book, Alina, <laughs> like a bunch of strangers were just like, this is clearly a book, like you have enough poems. Um, and that's when I like took seriously the idea of like, oh, I guess I should show a press or some other outside entity <laughs> what I have done. And then like, I don't know, I, I I, I don't mean to be like glib or whatever, but I really like I I got in like gentle arguments with my editor about like I don't believe that this needs like um, formal section breaks or this needs to be like sorted into like neat categories of poems or like whatever things again I assume help with like marketing or whatever I was just like I don't I don't really believe in that like let's find a way to like create a sequence here that feels like a sort of you know emotional like wave mm -hmm. um, in some capacity of course I care about the order and things like that but. Um, trying to find like 
you know, neat ways of packaging it was not super my concern. I was just glad that someone said I had enough poems to like print a book, <laughs> you know, and then I called it. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And I think, I think this book sort of fights for itself in, in the way that the poems are so in communication with each other in different ways. Like if you, I'm thinking if there were section breaks, I would, I'd be like, well, why? Right. Because they're, everything's sort of talking and it's sort of touching on the way that time is kind of moving. So maybe I'll ask my question about time, which, which comes up in a lot of different ways in the book, but I think that it's, it's really important for the collection to be kind of whole, but also with that, like you said, ebb and flow um, as well. So um, maybe I'll ask a question about time and then we'll get to Deborah's question here. Um, so within the poems, I mean, there's all these different mentions, right? I think one of my favorites was the quote from Aura, which says, for years, I've directed my laptop to install the critical update tomorrow. Like, I think that one, it's so relatable. And I think I just had one of those pop-ups come up when I was opening the Zoom here. <laughs> so I was like, no, I cannot, I cannot do that right now. Um, but there's also ways that the the speaker is, is talking about how like they're kind of losing their grip on time or time is is moving in ways that they don't understand. Um, and so I'm I'm wondering, how you see time almost as like a craft device here and and how it works maybe with or against this leaning into desire um within the book mm -hmm. yeah a, a lot of um yeah thank you for observing that um a lot of the book like grapples with time because i have a contentious relationship with it like one i mean as you can tell this like a little mystical cover i do have some like woo woo tendencies where i'm like not super grounded in linear time i've always felt a little outside of it i resent the clock i resent that i have to like you know do everything in my life oriented around the system that I had no say in, you know, and I, I feel that way extra. It's, it's like, you know, partly like my class background and like the way that like I've had to like move through the world is like, I've, I've never been able to like really choose what to do with my time for more of a day than that, which is like something I see in the book at some point. And like, I feel really resentful of that. I want us all to be able to like to not like whatever the fuck we want with our time we have to like we're accountable to each other and, and whatever we have to like stay grounded I understand in some way but like really feeling like the older I get the more resentful I am of this and like the more frustrated I am that I can't find a different way to live and then also mm -hmm. the more like precious and like loving I feel about moments where it does feel like we find ways to do that whether it's you know through sex or like psychedelics or like whatever it takes to get you there right mosh pits at some point I mentioned like feeling like something that gets me out of my body out of out of like this concept of time that we've created and into some other kind of like you know I want to call it like a sublime or whatever like mystical space but like something else like something else other than like the human experience that we have been kind of since we become like, you know, aware beings who can like think and move and speak for ourselves. Like we are just like put on this conveyor belt of like more or less, this is how you have to like move through the world. And like, you know, just like, I, and I bring this up in the book too. Like some days I'm just like, what is Tuesday? What does that mean to me? Like, what, what is that? Like, what does that have to do with like the way that like, was that put here to understand what Tuesday is, you know? And like feeling really jealous of that Norwegian island that voted to abolish time, which I read that poem, that mentions that at a reading recently and someone came up to me and they were like I went to that island and they actually did it they they did abolish time and I was like, yeah. so like, also like finding where I can um you know little anecdotes or like mentions of like ways that people have found to like jab mm. back at this and like puncture this and like I think that also has to do with like you know the way that like and I don't want to like say all queer people are like one way or another. There's certainly people who like uphold, who are queer and uphold like cis hetero, like, you know, really normative uh, structures. But I think maybe like the people that I surround myself with and like our views about like capitalism and like the world and all of this are very much in alignment and like against all of this. And like in those moments, I find like a sort of, I feel most like myself and like most human um and so yeah I, I really it's it's me fighting with time constantly throughout the book and being mad at it yeah no I love that and I think too that was something I noticed was there was sort of 
a sense of freedom in pushing against those expected boundaries, right? Like, okay, you're telling me I have 24 hours in a day, but what if we, what is that, you know? And I think there is a certain sense of, I mean, I don't, I don't love like <laughs> verbing the noun, but like queering the time and, and the sense of it in, in the book um, where maybe that identity comes through in a way that doesn't have to be like, here's my poem that's telling you I'm queer, right? And so I think it's just in the craft and in the fabric and in a certain way. Um, and also, I think it's great that you're talking about pushing up against this and maybe Deborah's question connects a little bit to this idea too, where her question in the chat is, do you wish you had no need for a day job or do you value that form of engagement with others outside of poetry work? Which really makes me think of the opening of route one, right? Where you say, when you ask what I do if I woke up tomorrow and didn't have to worry over money, I'd tell you, I tell you the truth, right? So I think Deborah's question is sort of being worked around in the book. So maybe if you could touch on that and then maybe we'll talk about capitalism a little bit through that. Yes, Deborah. Yes, that's all I want. If anyone here is super rich and wants to be my patron, I would love that. I promise I would use my my time well. But I just I have never I like when I say I have the heart of a slacker in the book. Like I actually I have like a good work ethic or whatever. Like I like to keep busy. I like to like you know finish what I start and whatever. But I've never in my earthly life believed in the concept of a career. Like it's just not. I just want to exist. I like I feel like that's what we were put here to do. And some people like get lucky and. The thing that they do for money is aligned with like how they want to exist in the world. I don't think that's true for not to like, I feel like I'm being a bummer, but it's like, um, I just, most people don't have that. It's a luxury, right? It's, it's an actual luxury to have that choice or you hustle so, 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 so hard um, and maybe find another way to do it. And I just really resent that too, that like, if you're born on third base, you don't have to do that. Right. And then like the rest of us, it's like grit, 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 grit. And maybe you'll get somewhere. And I like, you know, grew up hearing that as like a child of immigrants, of course, it's like, anytime I complained about my job, like, so my, my dad was a cab driver until he retired, right, and my mom, um, when we first came to America, she cleaned houses, she worked in factories, where she eventually became a computer programmer, but like, no one in my family has ever had a job that they chose out of like, interest, fun, enjoyment, whatever, and so like, anytime I've complained about work, and like, most of my jobs, after a certain point, like, I, I had like, service industry jobs, and whatever, and then like, moved into like, various like, administrative corporate like higher ed office whatever jobs like my mom was like I don't want to hear it like whatever you're complaining about is not important when I'm just like my soul is withering my mom's like do you think my soul wasn't withering when I was cleaning people's houses you know it's like there's no there's no room for that kind of so like maybe this book is partly like my primal scream of just like this was never given space in like mm -hmm. my household and like that could be partly cultural it could also partly be just like my parents being who they are but like just like no I don't like I'm not being a brat like I want this for everyone like I, I don't think I'm special and I don't have to work like I just want universal basic income I want like the rich to redistribute their wealth like I want us to just have a better world for all of us like not a big ass but yeah I wish I didn't have a day job to answer this question <laughs> I know I, gone are the day of patrons who support poets and just oh, now they want to like go to mars or like live forever like whatever crazy stuff people are up to like it's not they're not like funding theaters or like whatever you know the the who were they wander makers whoever like the, you know they like to put their names on buildings but at least the buildings were for like public you know right <laughs> yeah no, like, no those... building underground bunkers and you can't come unless you like you know work for us those days are long gone. Um, I think this does lead us well into to another overarching maybe theme of the collection, um, which was sort of talking about capitalism and what it does to art, what it does to desire, to poets, artists, people um, who are trying to survive. And I think something that I noticed maybe going back through the collection was the way that work is used in different ways and I mean we were just talking about jobs right <laughs> work but there's also you know like artist grants right the grant that's mentioned in the opening poem um day jobs work that happens within relationships maybe thinking of like you know the book as the work of the poet um 
I mean, there's just so many. I think I was like, oh, there's another instance, right? Or when when your mother asks if therapy is working. So there's sort of all of these little hints that we're we're operating within this system, even if we're trying to push outside of it. Um, and and even the the final poem, which is a wonderful closing poem. I was thinking of the word saving, right? Daylight saving and how there's, you know, we have to have save, like we're saving something in some way for our future, right? Which is increasingly bleak (laughs) these days. Um, But I'm just wondering, maybe this is a huge question, um, but what to you is the role of a poet in this society that continues to sort of devalue creativity, devalue community um, and artistic desire. Um, yeah, what what can we do as poets <laughs> to to get our work or I can't I can't call it work to write our poems um, and and do this thing that we love. Yeah, I I guess I have I have like two threads of response. One is like sort of like I really like thinking of poets as just like people who pay attention to Mm -hmm. the world around them and transmit that like I think uh, Matthew Zapruder says that like poems are like a heightened state of awareness and in a culture like speaking broadly where we just have to like everything's just like moving so fast like having you know a form of art that has the capacity and uh, desire to just like stop and like look around and like you know receive and then like retransmit that back out as like a you know conversation with and about the world uh feels really important to me um I think that's like kind of the noble goal and I also as I've very much alluded (laughs) earlier in our conversation like I really want to resist our art and art making feeding back into these like capitalist production consumption cycles where like you know I'm already being asked like what I'm working on next and I'm just like nothing man I'm hanging out like what is this like what I didn't come to art to like be a prolific and like grinding you know like everything else in life already makes its demands of us and like especially because it's not my source of income why would I treat it like just another thing that I have to like Um, you know, I have to like keep getting the next thing. And like, you know, I'm not trying to knock people who have like goals or like, even though I don't believe in them and neither does Eileen Miles. They have a great line about that. (laughs) I'm absolutely in opposition to all kinds of goals, Um, even though clearly they like, they do the most, but like, you know, the idea that like, I, I really believe like, I don't do anything with my poetry life that I don't feel like compelled to do in the moment, which I'm sure loses me like a lot of opportunities that like, you know, kick, like shooting myself in the foot, like could be applying for more grants, could be like, um, you know, trying to get prizes, like could be like super prolific and like trying to publish a lot. But I just like, again, that's like not what I came here for. Um, and I, I want to shout out my friend, Stephanie Colley, who won the NEA grant this year and had like something really beautiful in their like, you have to like write a statement when you win mm. the award. And they said, I don't like the idea of having a writing career in quotes, but I do have a writing life. I love writing for the way it doesn't have to go anywhere useful, also in quotes, mm. or productive, like love, like life. And I, I think you know, and there's no irony to me in that and like Stephanie winning this award and saying this because actually like the money like gave them the opportunity to actually like sit and have like, mm-hmm. you know, stop adjuncting for a minute and have like a bit of like a writing life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that the role of a poet is to just like really like, or my conception of it, like I, it was startling to think that like this thing that I thought was like a bit countercultural based mm-hmm. on like, you know, I loved the Beats when I was younger and then I loved the New York School, like these scrappy people who were kind of like doing weird shit together. And eventually it got like institutional recognition and eventually it got like broader like awareness and appreciation. But like fundamentally at the beginning it was a bunch of friends like, you know, screwing around with each other and like making the kind of art that they wanted to make. And I still believe that like find, you know, people who make compelling and interesting work that like, you know, is drawing you, surround yourself with them, mm-hmm. try to do the same, try to like, you know, put that out into the world um and the other stuff feels like really yeah icky and like part of the same like of of course I like want my work in the world it's like why the book exists and whatever but like after a certain point I'm just like I didn't come here to have like careerist ambitions like isn't that just like feeding back into the thing that Mm. I'm and we're complaining about you know yeah yeah I love earlier when you were talking about it as like a treadmill right 
and you see that where you you maybe have one thing barely finished and then you're already being asked about the next thing right so why right when you think you're going to get a break or a pause or that inhale like oh nope like this thing's still moving there's something that maybe someone or something wants from you to keep that those gears turning and I think it's really important in this conversation here and I so appreciate your honesty to talk about different paths to approaching this life right there's there's not just you know you have to go you have to study and you have to do your MFA and then you have to do this and then you have to teach and then you have to get the XYZ grants that everyone is applying for, right? I think it's a, it's really important to see that there are different ways to have a nurturing poetic life and, and feel fulfilled from things that are at the core of, of what it means to be a poet, um, even with all this noise that, that's happening and, and all the noise online as well as, yeah, you and I both perhaps Ex too extremely online sometimes <laughs> but that's all right we 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 do what we need to do <laughs> and you know that's a that's a form of community too I should say like I've I've met so many great writers and like been exposed to so many different kinds of work when it's mm. like you know all of that feels very much to me like just because I didn't get them my faith doesn't mean I don't care about like reading widely or like you know seeing what's going on and that feels like a more egalitarian way of like mm. coming across things where like there's not really a canon of which to speak on the feed, you know, it's kind of just like things coming across the transom and then like, I don't know, I get exposed to a lot of great stuff that way. And I've met a lot of great people. And actually like when I was planning my tour, like, thank goodness, I had some kind of like broader community to like call upon because, you know, small presses do what they can, but like no one was going to plan the whole tour for me. So it was like, who do I know in these cities? All right. These people who live inside the computer who I've been like talking to for years, you know, it's like, it's good to have all of these like, yeah. Yeah, it's like the real, the there's someone on the other end, right? And and yeah, I think that it's it's so important to to be able to have those networks of support too. And and um I love when when you can shout out someone's successes and and celebrate work and that's what we're here to do. And um yeah, so I'm, I'm so thankful that we've been able to to keep in touch too. Um, we have a couple more minutes, so if anyone has another question in the chat, um, I'll ask one and then we can always loop back. Um, but I'm wondering, Alina, how do you keep in touch with your creative practice? Like what brings you joy um, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and how do you maybe shut out all of these other pressures, these things that are pulling us in different directions? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, yeah, just because I'm kind of a anti like rigor and careerism in, in these ways, that I feel like don't serve my work. Like I've never been a person who's like, I'm going to like accomplish this. I'm going to like write a certain amount of words or a certain amount of poems or whatever. Like just because I disavow that doesn't mean I don't like, I don't know. I view kind of like daily existence as like I'm gathering poem stuff all mm -hmm. of the time. Like, you know, Jack Spicer says poets are radio that are just like tuning into different frequencies. So like what keeps me... Um, sort of feeling like I have any semblance of a creative practice is like I just go on super long walks and try to like notice what's going on around me um as like simple as that sounds going to a lot of readings or as many as I can reading a lot um live music museums art all of this like I feel like it's all percolating and ending up somewhere and I think someone asked about my process earlier and I didn't super answer but like that is pretty much my process is like more and more it's in my notes app because I'm like a millennial <laughs> uh elder millennial but still a millennial where like it's often easiest to, like I write a line in my phone poems don't often come to me like fully formed like an epiphany but eventually I gather enough material that I start to see how things echo each other or like are in conversation with each other or link together or like clearly I'm thinking about something a lot even if I'm like coming to it in different ways like I think I'm looking at a bird but what I'm actually like thinking about is like my mother or something like you know like things like there are resonances um and it's never worked for me any other way like I don't know some like I start thinking in like poem thoughts at mm -hmm. a certain point but really it's just like being in the world trying to be attuned um, trying to resist uh, sort of letting the drudgery of daily life overtake your brain to the point where you can't hear yourself in that way, where it's just like, oh, I have to like, 
schedule this appointment I have to pay this bill I have to like cook this food or whatever and then like it, it, it living like that gets me so away from like that that you know poetry material and matter mm -hmm. being able to enter but like you know we have to do what we have to do but really trying to keep those receptors as open as I can um, even if it means like spacing out in the middle of the work day <laughs> time theft you know wonderful all right so maybe I'll ask our final question which is do you have any sort of craft advice and maybe craft can be in quotes it doesn't have to necessarily be in particular to a specific I don't know, type of poem but anything that you could say to a writer just starting out just starting to explore poetry or or find their voice in some way I guess no one will be surprised to hear me speak in this way at this point but really like something I wish someone had said to me earlier was like the things that people tell you are important and good and like you know what you should emulate don't have to be the things that you latch on to so like you know when I was like reading Wordsworth and whatever in high school not that that stuff it has the canon has its place and whatever but like if I thought that's where poetry ended if I hadn't like been a terminally online teenager and like found you know like Richard Sykin's work on live journal and been like whoa and like Frank O'Hara and stuff I would have gotten turned off from poetry forever and I've like intercepted a lot of people in my adult life where it seems like that's true like mm -hmm. they had early like you know turn off encounters with poetry and then they never came back you know mm -hmm. and like they, they think that that's what the form is instead of this like super you know vibrant super multifaceted so many different ways to approach it mode of, of of writing and expression um so you know find find your affinities right like the things that you are drawn to mm -hmm. and you know absorb as much of that as possible and like I really feel like there's nothing wrong with being like a little derivative especially like early on and I still feel that way that like I'm such a mishmash of my influences like I mean that's the thing that makes your work yours it's like all of this like you know goes into the sauce and then like the sauce is you but like there's all these things that that make that um possible so you know read widely ignore the canon um <laughs> only trust your teachers if you like you know feel like they they see the world in the same way you do I guess mm -hmm. and not are not like you know hung up on like what they think is important um I think that's all like that's all the craft advice you need you know find what you like and then like try to do that in your own way mm -hmm. is, is as simple as that sounds and of course there's like lots of other craft stuff you can do that involves like you know exercises and like formal constraints and and all of that is cool and fun and you can definitely do that with the people whose work that you like they probably teach workshops you know <laughs> unless they're dead and then you can like have a seance and commune with them that way yeah no I love that I love you know the thinking of poetry is a conversation right every poet is in conversation with you know, the ones that you're kind of soaking up, but also the poets that maybe are coming after us that we don't know. So I think, yeah, finding, finding those anchor points for you and, and letting your voice shine is, is wonderful. And I think that's a perfect place for us to end. This is the worst part of the night is having to end the chat because I feel like we could be talking for hours. Um, but thank you so much, Alina, for your time tonight. Thank you. Um, to everyone in the, the viewing audience, thank you for your questions as well. Um, once again, please find and purchase a copy of Tosca so that you can read all of these amazing poems. Um, and, and again, thank you, Alina, for, for being so open and honest and diving deep into these questions with me. Um, it's been so nourishing. Thank you, Spasiba. I just also want to say thank you in Russian. I felt really warm. Thank you all so much. This was lovely. Thank you, Emily. It was such a wonderful conversation. So great to see you again. And thank you all for coming, spending your Thursday evening with some poetry. Um, so we will see you next time for the next craft chat. But thank you so much, Alina. I'm so glad that we were able to do this. And congratulations on the book. I mean, it is so wonderful and and I know I'll be returning to it in many different ways so I can't wait thank you so much